Well, our first song this morning is All My Hope Is In Jesus. It's the one uh, recently done by uh, David Crowder. But it's a reflection of all of, our, all of our lives. All of our hope is in him, isn't it? like 2000 around 2000 so uh, I was probably 10 then when I wrote it. <laughs> but this song talks about you know every day in our lives we have something that happens something that's either bad or something good and a lot of times we think that bad means that we have to act like it's bad to us you know, when we have something good that happens in our lives, we're really happy about it. We're, we're excited, and we don't let it get us down. When something bad happens to us in our lives, and trust me, I know bad. I've been through it, and I'm sure a lot of you have been through it. You've had your own bad moments that you've been through. Um, I had some really, really tarnished things in my life happen in my heart, and it hurt a lot. And I was almost to the point where I let that bad 
get to my life. You gotta let that bad happen. Bad's gonna happen. Bad ha bad's happening now. It's happening all over the world. This song I wrote to remind me that there is a choice. You can choice. You can choose to to look at something different, look at something positive, and by looking at the one person, the one God, and that's Jesus. Sometimes we, we let that slide, we forget because we let the bad come in and we forget that. But you know what? Once I realized that I had to let this bad happen and let it go and just be happy about the stuff that I do have, be happy about the blessings I have, I kept Jesus on my mind to get me through the bad. And when you mention Jesus, it's like happy. I mean, am I right? When you say Jesus, you think of happy because this person, this man, he went on the cross for that bad that I suffered. Even though I forgot, I remembered that finally and it did make a big impact in my life. That's why I wrote this song, Jesus on My Mind. It's not a slow song, it's a happy song. So. Bear, bear with me because you're probably gonna, your heart's gonna skip a couple beats, maybe. Uh, I gotta take my ring off because otherwise it'll melt. <laughs> Seven, 8, 9, 10, 11. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will 
sing the praises of your name, O Most High. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the peoples with equity. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, O Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Sing the praises of the Lord, enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the nations what he has done. Amen. You may be seated. As the gentleman come up here, Al said, you may be seated, but these, these next couple songs are not as upbeat and catchy as Johnny's song was, but they're very upbeat. Um, we're singing Lean on Everlasting Arms and Victory in Jesus. So, you know, if the spirit moves you, sing, you know, while you're staying, while you're singing, you know, clap your hands while you're singing. Well, just give it all to Jesus this morning as we do this next couple songs. What a fellowship, what a joy he finds to me on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace of mind to me on the everlasting arms.
seated. It is good to be together and to celebrate the Lord uh, together, and that is such such a good thing. <clears throat> Just a couple of announcements uh, right before I launch into the uh, message here. If you're online, uh, check like and uh, say hi to everybody, and, and uh, glad you're online today. Glad everybody is here uh, today. We are living in trying times, and uh, uh, certainly... Um, as this disease continues on, we pray even uh, more uh, fervently. And I, and I will speak to that a little bit later. But that uh, we will just uh, pray for the Lord to help us, for sure. Uh, if you have not prepared your communion yet in the auditorium, uh, we have communion up here in the front and back on the table right when you came in. And uh, you'll want to uh, get, you can do, if you haven't gotten it, you can do that now. Get up from your seats and go and get it. And uh, if you're at home, uh, get your juice and your bread ready uh, for when we uh, partake of the Lord's Supper uh, together in that very sacred time. <clears throat> Take your Bibles and turn to John 21. We'll go there in just a minute. Uh, now, this week, uh, for our great adventure readings, uh, we're, we're in three different books, so uh, I will say it uh, here, uh, and uh, uh, it, what we're going to do, well, I didn't put it on my thing here, I think it's in the bulletin, so I'm going to have to get a bulletin, just look in your bulletin, and because uh, I can't quote it out to you, it's not on the top of my head, and I have it wrong on my sheet right here. I can tell you this, it begins with 1 Thessalonians 5, and then it goes to 2 Thessalonians and then it's one chapter out of the next book. Which who, does it, can it, What is it? Second Peter. Peter, first chapter. There we go, right there. Thank you, Gene. Minute late, a dollar short, but we're good. <laughs> All right, there it is, right there in your bulletins. And uh, uh, that's that's some really good things for our great adventure uh, this week. <clears throat> also in the middle of the bulletin, since I have one in my hand, is uh, that column, How Can I Pray for Pray and Go? We have now launched Pray and Go. Our leadership uh, has gone out, and uh, we're going out to paying these door hangers on each home to let them know that we're praying for them. And we pray for each home, and we hang a door hanger on those homes, and we're starting with our neighborhood, and now we're inviting anyone in the congregation who wants to walk your neighborhood and pray for each home and uh, put a door hanger on there to let them know that we're praying for each home. Uh, there are uh, door hangers out in the lobby. You can pick up a package of 50 or a package of 100. If you want a package of 250, we've got those in the office too. Uh, but uh, this is not a uh, whim. Because we recognize that there is a, a great spiritual warfare movement that can happen with this. And as such, it need, everything needs to be undergirded with prayer. And if there's going to be positive results from this, it will happen because we have prayed. And so I just encourage the congregation on that as well. And one last thing. In your, in your bulletins, you have a connection card. And... Uh, you can fill that out now, and you can fill it out during the service as well. But this this is where uh, you get, to get this is where you get to put feet to your faith. And on the let us know section, uh, you can let us know that you plan to walk your neighborhood, or to uh, you'd like to be on the prayer team, and uh, you can read the specifics there. And uh, let us know that you're here today. And then you turn this in at the end of the service. And if you're online and you'd like to participate in the Pray and Go, give us an email and we'll get you uh, locked in as well. 
Can you do me a favor? Yes. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's the first response for some people. Other people, you say, can you do me a favor? Well, it depends. Depends on what it is. What is it, Jeff? Uh, then you ask some other people, can you do me a favor? Uh, no. I don't have the time. I don't have the resources. I'm not going to help you. I've asked this question through the years. Can you help out with this? Or can you help out with that for the Lord? And right now I'm asking you to engage in pray and go uh, for your service to the Lord. Either as a walker or as a prayer or as both. I mean, everybody can participate, certainly, in the praying part. And I would hope, I mean, you know, it, it, I would hope that 80% of us, at least 80%, I mean, I would really hope that 100%, but I mean, to really engage ourselves in, we're going to pray this through. Well, we read John chapter 21 this week, and there's a great story there, but I want to talk about the whole of John because it concludes here in John 21. The theme of love is woven through the Gospel of John. And you know the very first verse that, that's where John speaks of love in his Gospel. You can say it with me. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. In John 3 and John 5, it's, Jesus says, God loves the Son. And in chapter 8, if, if God were your father, you would love me, Jesus says. And in John chapter 10, Jesus says, The Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. And in John chapter 11, Jesus is talking with Martha. And it says, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And in John chapter 12, Jesus says, He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. Again in John chapter 12, it says they love the approval of men rather than the approval of God. That's not a good thing, is it? That's what the Pharisees did. They loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. And in John chapter 13, the chapter starts out, and he showed them the full extent of his love. And how did he do that? I'm asking for how did he do that? He washed their feet. That's how he showed the full extent of his love. Very good. You get an A. Whoever it was that responded. Oh, and if you responded in your head and you got it right, give yourself an A. And if you didn't know, go read John chapter 13. Then you'll know. All right, there you go. Then later in John chapter 13, he says to the disciples, Love one another as I have loved you. And then right after that, if you love one another, people will know. They'll know you are my disciples. And in chapter 14, Jesus tells these guys, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And in verse 21, he who keeps my commandments loves me. And verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and will come back to him. And again in chapter 14, he who does not love me does not keep my words. And in chapter 15, just as the Father has loved me, Jesus says, I have also loved you guys. I've loved you. Abide in my love. And then he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And then this great verse where Jesus says, Greater love has no one than this, than one do what? Lay down his life for his friends. 15, 13. Jesus says, The Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from the Father. Chapter 16. And then he says to Simon in chapter 21, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Isn't that amazing when you take one word, you look at one theme and see how it's woven through a particular book and, and just how, in this case, how wonderful it is. And, and yet very pointed at times. Well, I hope you read John 21, but I'm just going to tell you this. John says this is the third time Jesus showed up 
to the to, to the disciples. You see, at the beginning of his ministry, if Peter had been fishing all night, and, and James and John, and and they were coming in, and he said, "Hey, cast your net on the other side of the boat." No, no we fished all night. There's no fish out there, and, and so Jesus says, "Come on." And so they did, and then there was just so much fish. They go, "Who is this guy?" Well, now we get to John 21, and they're out there fishing. And Jesus is on the shore, and he says, uh, and they've been fishing all night, and they hadn't caught any fish. And so, and they're about 100 yards away, but you know how the voice carries across water. And this is early in the morning. Hey, guys, cast your net on the other side of the boat. Right. They did. It fills up with fish. They go, that must be Jesus. And so Peter, that's got to be Jesus. And so he put on his outer garment and jumped in. And I guess he swam the hundred yards and left the other guys to row in the boat while they're dragging the net behind the boat because it's so heavy they can't get the net in the boat. And, uh, and, and it's really interesting. It says that when they got to the shore and they counted the fish, there was 153 fish. Amazing. And they have these conversations, but then Jesus has this private conversation with Peter. Peter, do you love me more than these fish? You love me more than fishing? And what he's saying is, do you love me with no strings attached? Like God does. Peter says, Lord, you know I love you like a brother. So Jesus asked him a second time, he says, uh, Peter, oh, yeah, now yeah, I'll, I'll do it that way. So then he says, Jesus says, do you love me with no strings attached, Peter? Oh, Peter says, Lord, you know I love you like a brother. And then Jesus asks him a third time, Peter, do you love me like a brother? And it says Peter was kind of like putting this in, Lord, you, you know everything. You, you know I love you like a brother. And each time, after each one of those questions, Jesus said to Peter, feed my people. He uses the term lambs and sheep, but we know what he means. He says, feed my people. Peter, you, you, you denied me three times, that's true, but you're forgiven, you're reinstated, you've got a job now, so let's get after it. Peter, feed my people, feed my people. God's word has remained through the years. Year after year, people have heard or read John chapter 21. And when they read those words, Peter, do you love me? They hear the Lord saying, do you love me? Do you love me? Every Christian has been asked by the Lord, do you love me? And so the answer would be yes. And we may have responded to the knowledge of him. Yes, I believe in him. I believe in what he's done for me. But that's not the question. The question isn't, do you believe in me? The, 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 the question isn't, do you believe in the things that I've done? The question isn't, do you believe that I'm wonderful? The question isn't, do you believe that I'm great? That's not the question that Jesus asks his followers. What he asks his followers is, do you love me? Do you love me? So if your wife or your husband asks you to do something, hey honey, uh, would you do me a favor? If you love them, sure, you do, right? When a friend calls and they ask, hey, I'm in a pickle here, can you do me a favor? And our response generally is, if, it all, if it's all possible, if I, if, I can, if I can, I will help, I'll do you a favor. And as John has recorded here in, in, in the 21st chapter, this very personal conversation with Peter for all of us to study, we must realize that Jesus is asking us as well, 
Do you love me? And when Peter affirmed his love for Jesus, Jesus responded, feed my people. And that's the same response Jesus gives to us today as well. Jesus says to you, if you love me, feed my people. That means a couple things. You've got to meditate on this and think it through. What, what does this mean? Feed my people, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Remember when Jesus and the disciples and the 5,000 plus people were there and they says, we need something to eat. And Jesus said uh, to the disciples, he says, you, go, you guys go give them something to eat. Go feed them. With what? With, and they, you know, there was this little boy who had five loaves of bread and two fish. Yeah, right. I think that's how many of us feel when we hear the Lord saying to us individually, Go feed my people. And we go, with what? Who am I? What do I know? Even if you only have this much, you can feed somebody. You can encourage someone. You can point, as a light of Jesus, you can point someone to the light of Jesus. Remember, Jesus said to pray this, and I know you've prayed it before. Give us this day our daily bread. Right? You know what that means? Help, Lord, I need something now. I'm supposed to say something. All right, I need something. So you give, and he does, and he gives it, and we can say something. Give me what I need today, Lord, to be able to feed others, not just myself. And then remember, Jesus said, hunger and thirst for what? Righteousness. For righteousness. And then what will be happen? And then what will happen? You will be filled. So when Jesus continues to ask you and me this question, his response is always the same, feed my people. And there are thousands, multiple thousands of specific ways that that can happen. First of all, it has to do with what he directs us to do. And what did Jesus direct us to do? Deny yourself daily, take up your cross, and... Follow him. There you go. And the second thing he asks us, and we read through it in those love verses. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And so feeding has, must seriously be in the position of the angels before the throne of God. And what position is that? It's the position of one ready to carry out the command of God. Isn't that what we pray? May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So God says to the angels, I want you to go down and help that Northview Christian church on pray and go. And the angels will twitter, to them, well, we'll get to it tomorrow. <laughs> you think that's the angels' response? Of course not. It's, yes, Father, yes, God, here we go. We're on our way. I'm doing. And when... Jesus says to us, feed my sheep. We just start looking around. Okay, Lord, is it physical or spiritual? Who's in front of me today? Who's in front of me tomorrow? Who's in front of me this week? And then, Lord, I will do whatever it is you ask me to do. God's will is done immediately, quickly, without question or reservation in heaven. And so we pray that as well. So my question to each one of us today is this. Do we believe this? Do we believe what Jesus is asking us? Do we believe? Do you believe that Jesus is asking you to feed his sheep? If you do, then your next decision is to fulfill that request. In other words, Jesus says, hey, can you do me a favor? And our response is not, well, I don't have the time or the resources. We don't want to say that to Jesus, do we? And the other thing we don't want to say to Jesus is, well, it depends. Do you love me? Jesus asks. Mm -hmm. 
Some people are just content with attending church or watching online and then going about your life and your activities because you've just heard a message from Jeff and nothing will change. Others of you will hear the voice of Jesus asking you, do you love me? And then you will actually find a way to physically and spiritually feed those God puts in your path. We see the needs around us and we find a way to help. So we do what we can to be a light to our friends and to our neighbors. And that's what we're doing with Pray and Go, that the Lord is calling us to. The leadership has no question about this. And he's saying to us, feed my people. So let's worship the Lord in spirit and in truth and in doing things that reflect, feed my sheep, this worship.
take it out of my workspace here. Oh, oh just close it and set it to the side. Just close it. It's okay. Just close it and set it on the community table. Sorry about that. Oh, that's right. You're the boss. <laughs> The Lord's the boss. <laughs> You're the boss's helper then. Yeah, there you go. Get situated here. I don't want to spill anything. My wife tells me I'm kind of clumsy sometimes. So. All men in love. <laughs> Only in love. I'll get it together here in a minute. A lot of times I like to get up here and just kind of put my own things together, but this is kind of, well, it's kind of interesting because yesterday I knew I had to do this, and uh, this little book is just communion meditations, and I flipped it over and it came to this, and I thought, oh, cool, that sounds good, and it's amazing how the Spirit works because there's things in here that Jeff has talked about, and it just all kinds of come together. Amen. Many gatherings around this table are less than they could be. Tremendous joy and encouragement are absent because we fail to recognize and accept the grace of God given to the whole church. Paul the Apostle once wrote to a group of Christians who had divided over different loyalties. Some aspect of the grace of Jesus had caught their fancy and their devotion to that one aspect had caused them to discount or even deny other aspects of his grace. Paul had to remind them that in their limited devotion they had lost the fullness of Jesus. Then Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 21 3.21-23 So then let no one boast in men for all things belong to you. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come. All things belong to you, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. It's good to remember as we gather here that our discipleship is toward Jesus. It is of him that we eat and drink. He is our sustenance. Therefore, all he gives, we accept. As we prepare to partake, Let's determine to accept the gift of God and all its packaging so that we will really rejoice when he comes to claim all that are his. Jesus gave a new command to his disciples. He said that they must love each other as he loved them. If they did this, everyone would recognize them as his disciples. And this is in John 13, 34, and 35. And the big thing is here is can others see the love in you and recognize you as a follower of Christ? That's what it's all about, people. We can have Christ in our hearts, but if we don't share it, it means nothing. So let's think about those things as we partake. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this loaf. It is, it is a representation of your body, Lord, that was broken and, and, and cut and beat upon that cross, Lord. And Lord, because of it, Lord, our sins have been forgiven along with the blood that you shed, Lord. And, and Father, these are all things to represent what you did for us. And Father, we need these things because we are truly a forgetful people. Lord, I pray that you would bless this loaf and bless this cup now as we do partake. For in your son's holy name I pray. Amen.
reading of Scripture. First Thess Thessalonians, chapter 1, verses 2 through 10. We always thank God for you all and always mention you in our prayers. For we remember before our God and Father how you put your faith into practice and how your love made you work so hard and how your hope in the Lord Jesus Christ is firm. Our friends, we know that God loves you and has chosen you to be his own. For we brought the good news to you, not on, only with words, but also with power and the Holy Spirit, and with complete conviction of its truth. You know how we lived when we were with you. It was for your good. You imitated us and the Lord. And even though you suffered much, you receive the message with joy that comes from the Holy Spirit. So you became an example to the believers in Macedonia and Acacia. For not only did the message about the Lord go out from you throughout Macedonia and Acacia, but the news about your faith in God has gone everywhere. Pray and go. There is nothing then that we need to say. All those people speak about how you received us when we visited you. And how you turned away from idols to God. To serve the true and living God. And to wait for his son to come from heaven. His son, Jesus, whom he raised from death and who rescues us from God's anger that is coming. Let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, so much for your word, your pure word, your truth. Though these words were penned some 2,000 years ago, they hold true today, Lord. And though the words that you had your writers pen as far back as uh, the book of Genesis, Lord, and the truth that you and your spirit have given to us, Lord, we know are true. We stand firm on your word. We love you, Lord. Guide our hearts and our thoughts to serve you, to honor you, so that you are glorified through your son, Jesus. Amen. also invited Roy Cole to come and bring a special for us today, which he's going to do. And uh, so, Roy, if you come up and sing your special song. Okay. By myself? Well, I don't know. Did you want us to join? You'll be singing by yourself. Okay. Did you want us to play with you or not? You can. Appreciate it. Not anywhere. <laughs> oh, there you go. As you know, we're all got mamas, right? How many's got a mama? Raise your hand. <laughs> My mama, she's going to heaven. But in Kentucky, she uh, taught me a lot of songs when I was little, raising up. I heard her sing, I saw the light, a lot of them. But this is for our mamas. Mama didn't have a special training She couldn't read the music Just a word But when she stood and sang on 
Sunday morning She had the prettiest voice I think I ever hear She loved to sing the songs about our sin There is a fountain was her favorite one Cheeks a sinner. By the time my mama's song was done, when mama sang, the angels stopped to listen. She couldn't see the love light in her eyes. Now in heaven, sure, she had a special place. You know, my daddy wanted me to sing a song the day that mama left us. And you know that little church was filled with all mama's friends. And you know, it seems we could all hear Mama sing when I couldn't finish up her favorite hymn. When Mama sang, the angels stopped to listen. You could see the love light shining in her face. You'll stop to listen. That's true. Now in heaven, sure, she had a special place. Mama sang, the angels stopped to listen. That's from Mama. for here at Northview? What are we known for? Well, I can tell you several things. We're known for the live nativity church in every December, right? Yeah. 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 We're known with the, we're the church that has the crosses out on the hill. People drive by, they see that, right? Uh, oh, you guys are the church with the bridge and the gazebo where the pictures are taken. Did you know that this parking lot is full on prom night? It is. It's full on prime night because people come here and this place is loaded with, with couples taking their nifty pictures out there at Northview Christian Church. Northview is that, oh yeah, that's that church where they do the concerts out in the bowl, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the church. And now we've already heard this last week from the community. We're the church with the Bible barn. I want to tell you something. I am so proud of our men, how they got out there and worked in that heat. <clears throat> As I told them on our prayer thing, none of them were spring chickens. But, I mean, we were praying, and one of them started bar uh, cawing like a chicken. <laughs> we were having a good time before the Lord. But these guys worked so hard. And in seven days, uh, we were able to get that Born up there. Now, it's not been officially named yet. You got your connection cards? I don't think you've turned them in yet, have you? No, you yeah. haven't. So if you have a suggestion or a nomination for a name for this ministry center, this distribution place, this collection agency, oh, wait a minute, that's probably not a good one, is it? <laughs> this 
embassy for the ambassador's partnership between South Africa and Coldwater, this palace for the kingdom of God, this barn like the manger barn in Bethlehem that housed the word of God. Amen. His name is Jesus. If you've got a suggestion, put it on the connection card there, and uh, we'll put them into the pile, and by the time we dedicate that, uh, uh, we'll just call it a garage for right now, uh, we've got uh, garage doors that got to go on, and uh, looks like the landscaping's been done, probably need to plant some grass. Anything else, Larry? Right there. Make, make a little walk door, yeah. Okay, so... So we're, we're right on the cusp there saying we're done. Thanks for being the foreman for that, Larry. There's a lot of other things people could say about Northview. You're the church that, and you may have heard a lot of things. This week when we read about the Thessalonian church, and Al just read a few of those things from chapter 1, Paul had a lot of compliments for this Thessalonican church. Their faith was so real that it made them work for, the king, for God's kingdom. Their love for the Lord was so strong that they labored in great ways to feed Jesus' sheep. Their hope was so sure in the promises of God that it helped them to endure the worst persecutions, just like Jesus did. And when they first heard Paul teach and preach about the message of Jesus, they accepted his words as the word from God, and the power of the Holy Spirit was evident in their lives. You could see the changes that, that they made. And Paul told them how he and Silas were miraculously delivered in Philippi by the hand of God when God started that well-known church in Philippi. And while Paul and his companions were in uh, Thessalonica, they were only there for a couple of weeks, but they suffered verbal assaults. And, and the people saw this, and yet they, were, they believed Paul and his message about Jesus. And then they were run out of town, but, but as the years went by, the Thessalonian Christians suffered severely for the gospel at the hands of their very own people. And yet, they were filled with the joy of the Lord because the Holy Spirit was working in their lives through faith. As a matter of fact, Paul says that they were a model church for all the churches in Macedonia and Achaia. We know it now as Greece, Bulgaria, and Yugoslavia. But this church in Thessalonica was known in a very large region because of the way they believed. Not that they believed. Many believed. There were many churches started. Oh, but this church, they believed and acted in faith, hope, and love. And what they were known for is that they had turned from worshiping the pantheon of the gods and the idols. Everybody in that day and in that time gave their homage to Zeus, Poseidon, Demeter, Athena, Apollo, Artemis, Ares, Aphrodite, Hermes, Dionysus, Apollyon, Hercules, and many, 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 many others. But this group of people, no. They turned from everything that their culture did. They turned to serve the living and the true God. As they waited for the imminent return of Jesus, who is going to rescue us from the wrath of God. And Paul directly complimented them to their faith. He wasn't talking to other people. He said right to their face. You, he asks it in a question. For what is our hope? our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Question. Do you think Paul was proud of him? <laughs> he was so proud. 
in the best of senses because they had changed. They had changed from being worldly to godly. Didn't mean they didn't have problems. All you got to do is read 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians to see. Yeah, this church that is the crown and joy of Paul's ministry, they still had problems too. See, a perfect church isn't a church that's perfect in the human sense. The perfect church is where God cleanses his people and makes them perfectly holy in his sight so that we can stand before him. But we struggle each day, and that's what Paul is writing. He's saying, you guys are doing good, but you can do better. That's what he says. He says, you're doing these things, but why don't you do more of it? But Paul had a fear. And he wrote that fear down. He feared that they could be tempted by Satan, and that their faith would be weakened. From the human point of view, that would be perfectly normal. How many times have we seen a person or a group of people or even a church over a period of time and stuff happens and Satan temptations get in there and they give up? Some walk away, some just choose not to get involved, but they just become disheartened. Faith is weakened by compromise, no question. When we give in to worldly temptations, our faith is weakened. Faith is weakened by justifying wickedness as okay. Boy, do we see that happening in our culture today. Is that bad has now been lifted up as good, and good has been torn down as, as bad. Faith is weakened by persecution because the tempter persuades people that God doesn't care for them. Or that he doesn't know. Or some just come to the conclusion, God can't, if this happens, God can't exist. Paul said that he was afraid that his hard work that he had done among them had gone the way of the first, second, and third soils of Jesus' parable. Do you remember what they are? The hard soil, the rocky soil, and the weedy soils. It says that Satan came away and stole away the seed. But no, he says, I love it when he says, but no. Till he said, Timothy, Timothy found out about their faith. He came back and told Paul the good news, and that's why he's writing this letter. Timothy brought the good news about the strength and the vibrancy of their faith and of their love. And he was so excited that Satan had not been able to get them off task, that he hadn't gotten them to doubt so that they gave up, but that they were staying strong in faith, hope, and love in Jesus Christ. And now Paul is strengthened to face his persecutions and trials for the Lord that he is going through at the time because they are standing firm in the faith. Let me tell you, that always does a preacher's heart a lot of good. When people stand in the faith, they stand firm, and stuff happens, and tragedies happen, and trials happen, and, and there's a famine of many things that can happen. But when a person stands strong in the faith and says, I will not give up, I'm going to remain strong in the Lord, oh, how that strengthens the leader's hearts as they continue on in the work of the Lord. But I want to tell you what a lot of preachers fear for the church in 2020 and 2021 and in 2022. And it's real. And it includes me. We are afraid that when this pandemic has subsided, and we don't know when that will be, and we must all be careful for one another, in this time. 
But when this pandemic has subsided, are people just going to sit at home, enjoy sitting at home, watching church in their pajamas, and never return to fellowship? Because it's just a whole lot easier than getting everybody ready and, get, and going to church because, you know, that's just hard. And it seems like, you know, every time we go to church, we just get an argument on the way to church anyway. Not recognizing that, that even going to church can be a, a period of spiritual warfare. It can. This is one of the great weaknesses of the modern church. We all each need to examine ourselves on this. People have come to believe and to accept that going to church is the main, is the main activity of a Christian. You know, where, where, you're a Christian. What do you do? I go to church. Because if I go to church, then, then I've done my duty as a believer, and now I can go on with my life. I've checked it off. Church. Now I'm going to do my week. Let me reveal something to you this morning. Going to church isn't the goal. Amen. Going to church accomplishes the goal. So what's the goal? There's not just one, there's several. One is fellowshipping around the Lord's table and with each other together. The fellowship of the saints in the presence of God. We're in the presence of God this morning. We, we get an encouragement and a motivation when we gather together that we cannot get in any other way. I don't care how many online sermons I watch. I don't get motivated like when it's live and present. Amen. It, it, we don't serve the Lord. I've got to be careful. I want to be careful on how I say this because it, it doesn't matter how I say this. Some people will, will just hear what they want to hear. Okay? Amen. Uh, <laughs> We can serve the Lord in individual ways. We must serve the Lord in individual ways. But we, Christianity is not a lone ranger religion. Amen. Jesus came to establish his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church is meant to be a group on a mission for the kingdom of God. And we do it together. As a group. Now again, there's a thousand different ways that that can look like. But that's, that's what we are. And, and in doing that, we increase the effectiveness of Jesus' church. And you can't accomplish this part of what it means to be the Lord's church by staying home. We must do that. Some must do that now. It's important. But it's not the big picture. Another thing we preachers fear is that a great percentage of families with, with children will choose to not be a part of church fellowships and will, use, will lose future generations to the world and will lose future generations to the ways of the world. I mean, that had already been happening before this pandemic even hit. Our culture has gotten to the place and the church has so reduced in priorities in people's mind that we want to be involved in fun things for the kids, in ball games and trips to the beach and a thousand other activities because fun has become the attainable goal. And God has been relegated to the back burner. And even at home, the Bible stories are not read and Christian training is no longer the banner being held by many who have professed Christ. Ask your grandchildren. Tell me the story of David and Goliath. If they can't do that, a red flag is going up. Amen. You know something's not happening that should be happening. Tell me about Adam and Eve. Tell me the story of Jesus. And if your grandchildren can't give you the thumbnail sketch of that, grandparents, the red flag is up and something's got to be done. All right? But once this pandemic has subsided, we're going to feel footloose and fancy free to do all the kinds of fun stuff we want to do. And will moms and dads really pursue so much fun for the kids that the Lord gets left in the dust way, way behind? 
And it's not just this generation because it impacts all the future, future generations as well. And there are many other associated fears, but I'm not going to keep going down this path. It's just that Paul has said that he's afraid for the Thessalonian church that this would happen because of the temptations of the devil, and he was so glad to hear that that had not happened because they had held strong to the faith. And that's what we need to do because these are, there are so many tem compromises that the, de that the devil is providing for us in these days and times, and... If we let these compromises prevail, the church will shrink. Now, Jesus said, when he comes back to earth, I, this, to me this is just one of the most disappointing questions. Jesus says, when I come back to earth, will I find faith? Will I find faith? Because there are going to be so many Compromises that seem so good. But all those compromises leave the Lord and his church in the dust. Because there's no thought of eternity other than I hope I go to heaven. So if the devil can get people to think that church is secondary and not all that important to one's faith, then there are generations of souls that he has kept out of the kingdom of God. So the church in Thessalonica was known for its way, it, the ways that it lived out its faith. And their faith got stronger through the trials, not weaker through the trials. And it, he, he said severe suffering. That's the way he put it, severe suffering. Paul encouraged them to continue to do what they were doing and to do more of it. It encouraged them to live godly lives and to love one another. He says, as you are already doing, but do more of it. And I would suppose that if Paul were to write us a letter, he would say, you know, Northview, you're doing some good things. But don't let those things be an end in themselves. Go to church so that the goal of the church can be accomplished. Let your faith, hope, and love be in Jesus Christ. Do the live nativity so that the, so that the good news of Jesus can reach New people, work for faith, labor for love, hope for Jesus, Northview. Do the concert so that Jesus will be glorified and the church will be strengthened to serve the Lord. And don't glory in that garage that collects and distributes the word of God. Glory in our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the hope of the world. It's simply a tool that leads to the real goals. They are not the goals in and of themselves. And, these, these, and the greatest goal of all, all of these things, is so that we and so that others can have fellowship with Jesus. Isn't that right? Amen. We want to have fellowship with Jesus. And we're going to uh, sing a song here, I Surrender All. And the words go, go ahead and come on up for singing. All to Jesus, all to Jesus. I surrender all to him. I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. In his presence, I'll daily live. And then the chorus goes, I surrender all, I surrender all, I surrender all. It's a prayer. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Can I encourage you not to make this a song that you sing, but a prayer that you sing right. to the Lord as each one of us give our lives again to him today, all to Jesus.
Wrong program. Hey! 